and welcome to the Environment Show. At the end of February, Storm Xynthia pummeled Western Europe, leaving a trail of destruction and killing dozens. The bulk of the death toll was in France, where at least 53 people died. In the immediate aftermath of the storm, President Nicolas Sarkozy vowed to find out how and why the levees and dams that were supposed to protect the French coast failed and to make all the necessary adjustments so that France could confidently say never again. One country has become something of a reference in terms of water technology and water management. This week we're in the Levy Savvy Netherlands where we'll be looking at the way the low-lying country protects itself from the sea, how it then exports its environmental knowledge worldwide and finally how poorer countries can make expensive climate proofing their own. But first, the news in brief. <laughs> The sushi war rages on. A US and EU-backed proposal to ban trade in bluefin tuna is angering Japan, which consumes three-quarters of the global catch. The United Nations ban is currently under discussion. France is calling for a partnership to reduce emissions from deforestation. From the Amazon to the Congo Basin, the practice makes up 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. The Netherlands is one of the world's most densely populated countries, but as its name indicates, almost 20% of its total area is water and over a quarter is under sea level. I'm standing here in front of one of the Dutch Master's flagship projects, the Maalslant Storm Surge Barrier, one of the Earth's biggest moving structures. But this is just one cog of a complex network of dams, barriers, pumps and canals that helps keep the water out and the country dry. It's the symbol of the Netherlands' age-old determination to hold back the tide, the Melslant barrier. The barrier is used to close off the new waterway and uh, protecting the, the land behind it, so Rotterdam and other cities. When there's a big storm, they have to close first the ducks where the arms are uh, in rest phase. They have to be put under water, so the whole thing floats up a little bit. It will take one and a half hour to close, to sink the, the arms on the river. Approximately half the country is prone to flooding. The Delta Plan was set up after the catastrophic North Sea flood of 1953, when almost 2,000 people were killed. The Dutch cranked up their defences with a network of engineering masterpieces. But faced with the added factor of anticipated climate change, the country has decided to try a new approach. That we call building with nature. No longer dams and dikes as bulwarks against the sea, but instead dunes and beaches in harmony with the sea. At the heart of this sustainable approach to climate buffering is a new method to literally grow the coastline. Just a stone's throw from The Hague, engineers are introducing massive quantities of sand along the coast, planting high grass to stabilise it and letting nature do the rest. Well, what we see here behind us is the village of Terheide, which is uh, located just behind the dunes. In previous times it had been moved three or four times inside because it was eroded. And for that we have designed an innovative concept, which in fact is a huge amount of sand that we place in front of these dunes inside of the sea. The sand engine is a, a, a total length of one and a half kilometers into the sea and we use approximately 20 million cubic meters of sand. Make nature build for us a natural dune defense. The Dutch expertise has also a lot to do with attitude. Water management is a way of life here. A good example is these floating houses. When the water rises, the house rises with it. But in something of a sea change, the country has also begun surrendering small parts of its reclaimed land back to the waters. Defying sea and storm requires compromise. Now you've seen how the Dutch rein in the elements, but can that really apply to places as diverse as Florida, Saudi Arabia or Bangladesh? Some three billion people, at least half the world's population, live in coastal areas vulnerable to the worst effects of climate change. Well, ten years ago, the Netherlands Water Partnership was set up to stimulate cooperation and synchronise efforts to climate-proof the most at-risk regions throughout the world.
A huge storm surge barrier at the heart of New York City. Dutch engineer giant Arcadis came up with the idea to protect the city from severe flooding. At 1.4 kilometers long, it would be similar to the one in Rotterdam. When activated, two giant steel doors would close the 262 meter wide main entrance. The gate would be placed at the base of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, the main access channel to New York City's port. Venice up to its knees in water. Ever since its birth, city officials have been battling the elements. The Mose project was launched in 2003 to put a stop to the high water tides which threaten the city. The 4 billion euro project consists of building a system of 79 mobile barriers designed to protect the three entrances to the Venetian lagoon. It was drawn up in part by three Dutch companies. Dubai has tread into the waters of the Persian Gulf, and these artificial islands are proof. It's the pride and joy of the city, but the project wouldn't have been possible without Dutch dredger Butzkalis. The company's trademark, ships equipped with long arms capable of gathering sand from the ocean floor, which they can then transport over long distances and reshape landscapes with. In France, it's estimated that repairing and updating existing levees will cost a million euros per kilometre. But what are the countries that can't afford such extreme climate proofing? Let's take a look at Benin, where the shrinking coastline is as much nature's doing as it is a man-made problem. These are the devastating consequences of the coastal erosion on buildings in Benin. The phenomenon is not new but has been accentuated since the 1960s and the construction of the port of Cotonou. Several meters of land are lost every year to the sea. This, for example, is all that is left of the former communications minister's house. This building had two stories with a lot of furniture and glass doors, but he was only able to live there for less than a year. The government wants to put down these kinds of rocks along 12 kilometers of coastline to limit the encroachment of the sea. It has just finished laying down these tracks. They will be used for the transport of the rocks. Authorities say the first levy will be started next September and they hope to finish two of them by the end of the year. The government also promises that sand from the beach is no longer extracted for making concrete as this only used to hasten the coastal erosion. But the official plans will seriously disrupt some people's lives. Starting from the sea and going inland, over 60 meters, they are going to destroy everything, to lay stones down and prevent the sea from moving forward. I settled here last August. Now they've just told me to leave within a few days. I bought a lot of equipment. Now my business is threatened. The laying down of rocks has not yet started, and in the meantime, some have decided to live in the abandoned houses that are still standing. That's it for this week's flood of information from the Netherlands. We'd like to extend our special thanks to our producer, Yong Chim. Join us next week for another edition of Environment.